Okay, well, I found this pot in a, a flea market over near Pottstown back in, I guess, 1977. And I really liked the story it had to tell. It had fallen over in the kill. It had been fired like this. And some uh, wood ash had landed on it and gotten really hot and melted. And I just liked the story that this pot had to tell. It had a real personality. And so I wanted to learn how to make this kind of work. And so I got in touch with a, uh, uh, a potter who uh, was working in Japan. And in 1978, uh, he came here and we built the first Onagama at Junietta, the first incarnation of the present kill. Well, I was making pots when I came here. Um, I, I had learned how when I was teaching high school English, and I just never gave it up. I stayed with it. I took night classes. I went to college in the summer at Alfred University in New York State. And um, so I just combined them for about 10 years. I guess part of it is the need for many people to experience some process from beginning to end and to have a product, something they made, something they say, this is mine. I took responsibility for this. I, I produced this object, this pot, this sculpture, whatever it is. And that, that is very fulfilling. And for many people, there's a, a lack of opportunity for that kind of fulfillment. Lots of times, students hear about the clay class from other students, their roommate or somebody else, and they come up and they look in, and it just seems intriguing to them. It seems like something they might want to do. And so they come up, they know it's a lot of work, they know it requires time, and so... Um, it, it's a small percentage, but then when we have a sale at the end of each semester, that's often the first time that students and faculty encounter handmade pots. It takes a gallon of spit to load the onigama. Somebody figured it out. One of these analytical students. some um, clay, li liquid clay, and dip newspapers in it and just thwack it up against here and it seals it very nicely. And if the bricks are warm, it just sticks.
Good evening. How are you doing? Splendid. How are you, good. Ashley? Pretty good. That's a spirit. When you drink out of your own cup that you made yourself, there's there's just a sense of uh, satisfaction. And when you offer somebody a cup of tea, a cup of coffee in a cup that you made, or you pour them tea from a teapot you made, it's something very few people in our culture get to do. And what what comes with it is an enormous sense of gratification on the part of the person who made the object, as well as uh, the person who's receiving it. So it's an it's an offering. Every creative act is potentially an offering from the maker to the perceiver. I left that piece of plywood in there I was sitting on. Did you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there goes that one. <laughs> yep. There they are. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> <laughs> you ready? Now here's this thing we have we have to do the clapping bit. Matches. Oh, the clapping bit. We have to do are the you clapping putting, bit. Are you putting this me on? gets the attention of all of the good spirits and chases away the bad spirits. And you guys can do it too. It goes like this and and I'll demonstrate and then we'll do it three times. It just goes Okay? Why am I thinking of cheers? <laughs> All in tune? Ready? Set? All right. It's probably going to be a stretch to get those leaves burning. But we have lots of matches. Glenn, our supper doesn't depend on this. <laughs> time they had a um, this famous American Indian potter named Maria came to State College and, and the Indians in the Southwest all fire with uh, cow patties and they were going to do a, a cow patty firing out in front of the hub but it had rained for so long before they got there the students went out and got all these cow patties but they had to dry them out in the gas kill before they <laughs> would burn. before they could fire with yeah. them yeah High tech to low tech. That's great. Hey, well, that was the right match. It's just very exciting. It's never, ever become something that seemed like I had to do it. Uh, I mean, was forced to do it. It's something I always wanted to do. And, uh, if you can find anything like that in your life, like fishing or I don't know, whatever it is, if it's something that sustains you in a way that you can't wait to do it again, you're glad you did it, you wouldn't rather be anywhere else than what you're doing, I think you're, you're probably part of a pretty small minority of people who has a sense of you know, daily purpose. I usually go in at about four in the morning and um, somebody is on the shift with me and we, we start telling stories about our lives and our experience and that just doesn't happen in a classroom situation. It's a one-on-one -on -one situation. I know the students get to know themselves and one another better in that context. It's kind of like taking a field trip that's just across the street from your dormitory. Some Germans come up for um, my sister's wedding this year. It's it nice having them around. We had German breakfast every morning. Yeah? yeah. They have meat for breakfast. Mm -hmm. We had meat tray and bread and cheese and, cheese, mm -hmm. and meat cheese for breakfast every morning. Oh, sounds strange to me. See all that salami for breakfast. Mm -hmm. We figured once the lemon was well on its way, we'd use off the lunches. Alright. Perfect. That sounds lovely. Huge benefit.
I got a little grant from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, and at that time there was a, uh, a fire brick source over in Alexandria, just 10 miles away, and they donated bricks for the kill, so we were able to build it. About three of us, but four of us, built it in the summer of um, 78. And that was, uh, uh, let's see, we had that for about six years. 84, we tore down a small one and built a larger one. Three years ago, we tore the front end off and, and rebuilt a, a more efficient firebox. The analogy I always use is like, it's the, like the Vermonter's axe. Three new handles and two new heads, but she's still a good old axe. change gloves if you have another pair of yes. gloves here. Maybe we should have done this one first. I don't know if that's just it. It's a small percentage of people who, who really want to make things. It's quite a risk. If you're not a maker who has maintained a sense of wanting to make something original, 
you know, we, we encounter that when we're in grade school, when we're kids. We just play with stuff, put stuff together. But it's very rare that somebody continues that motivation all the way through. Making functional pots, <clears throat> that's always been my main orientation. There's lots you can do with clay besides make functional pots, but that's, I think, is a way of uh, involving other people because everybody needs to eat out of some kind of bowl. Everybody needs to drink out of a cup, and, and we like to think that, that we make things that other people can enjoy. Well, this is quite a nice piece. This was sent to me by a friend out in Oregon, and um, I think he'll enjoy that. That's a different kind of clay. I think that there is a balance between challenge and achievement, and I think we all need that in what we're doing to have a sense of uh, purpose sense of uh, destiny, if you will, um, that there always needs to be something that you don't know that is alluring and makes you want to continue and, uh, and to build on that knowledge incrementally. And while at the same time realizing that every time you solve some technical or process-oriented questions, that opens up another series of questions that you want to pursue. And if you're not being aesthetically rewarded by that process, then it, it's not really integrated the way that it ought to be. So there has to be the, the kind of the, the world of matter and the world of spirit. And they, they uh, if you're lucky, they, they come together. There's just so many things that can go wrong. There's so many variables. This is really wonderful here. See, it was fired on its side and the, mm -hmm. and the glaze ran down and made that little pond. I joked that if I made a $2,800 pot, I'd have all the rest for free. <laughs> but now... I don't know other people who are getting these saturated blue violet colors. I would have liked to have some of these in the show.
one of our great potters, Warren McKenzie, said that if you only have your own work in the house, it's like talking to yourself. <laughs> I really believe that. So, yeah, most of the things I've had, I've traded with other people, and I enjoy using and owning things made by other people, students, other potters. Yeah, it's a great way to learn, too, to be in the presence of other people's work. You just you look at it. it. It helps to inform your own sense of what you're doing. It's hard to have a favorite part. I like loading. I like to to look at the work and find out where it might be placed in the kill to best advantage. I like seeing people encounter a situation that's completely foreign to them, something they don't have any idea about and learn about it piece by piece. I like the firing, of course, it's really dramatic unloading the pieces. I like seeing people experience their work after it's gone through this incredible transformation. It's really, it's a very integrated process and I'm, I'm always learning from it. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs>